Usually when we are studying what the Bible has to teach concerning repentance, we touch upon the topic that I am going to deal with this afternoon. But in teaching on repentance, because it is such a singular important step in becoming a Christian, and when one as a child of God sins in gaining forgiveness uh, as a child of God, we usually and rightly so emphasize what repentance is. That it is a breaking down of the old stubborn will of man, which is the seat of all sin and rebellion to God. The question that arises, how does that happen? And that's when we normally go to what the Bible teaches that works repentance. And that's godly sorrow. Sorrow toward God for our sins against Him. Paul, in writing the second letter to the church in Corinth, knew what he had said had to be done by certain ones in the church, in fact, the whole church, concerning the man who had his father's wife, as well as other sins that you learn about when you read the first letter that they needed to turn from or to repent of. But in speaking of this situation in the church at Corinth, we, we learn a lot about what we want to speak on this afternoon. In chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, in verse 8 we read, beginning, verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He's saying there what we've often said, I didn't want to have to do this, but the case demanded that I do it. And it worked well when we did it. But sometimes we'll say, are you going to make me give you a spanking as we speak to a child? Well, the truth of the matter is, a uh, child does make a parent, if the parent's what the parent ought to be, <laughs> exercise uh, proper correctional discipline on the child. Certainly if the child is living like the child ought to live, the parent's not going to discipline for that. So the child is, in effect, drawing from the parent the corrective uh, discipline necessary. And by the word corrective, shows the child needs correcting. So we may say things like that. I, you know, I didn't want to do this, but there was no other way by the actions that you took. So that's what he's saying here. And because notice verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, I, we didn't want to go through that. But that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry, and here it is, after a godly manner. So that tells me there's a godly sorrow, and there's sorrow that's not godly. And I'm interested, and you're interested, first of all, in our own lives, because we know we must repent, obedient to God's will to become a Christian, Acts 17, 30, Luke 13, 3, and 5. And that as children of God, when we sin as children of God, then we know that we need to repent of our sins and confess those sins and pray to God for forgiveness. So Paul is saying, I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, the church, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us and nothing. You know, the Word of God accomplishes what God intended the Word of God to accomplish any time that it's preached. As we mentioned Wednesday night, it does not return void. But sometimes we think that it doesn't accomplish what it should with people because we don't see them believing it and humbly obeying it. But take Pharaoh, for example. Now, God, knowing all that is the object of knowledge, that is, he's omniscient, he knows all that's knowable. If you read all about Pharaoh, God will say, I've raised you up to basically show my glory in you through these plagues that he brought upon them to prove that uh, Moses was letting God's will be known concerning Israel being let go. Well, you'd say, well, it was, you mean that was good for, that good came out of this business as far as Pharaoh and his house is concerned? No. You see, the word of God will harden hearts at times. 
And it was meant to do that to certain hearts. The heart that is dishonest and receives the word in a dishonest heart and will not change, the word of God will harden that heart. Not that God meant it ultimately to harden the heart. He meant it to convert people. But my disposition makes a difference in what that word of God does. My disposition. The old illustration is used to say uh, one of our wonderful cool days in the middle of August. If you want to go back to make it extra hot, go back a year ago. And you take clay that you make a pot out of. And then you take wax. And you put them side by side in the sun. One's going to get harder. The other one's going to melt. Same sun, same proximity to one another, same temperature. Why? Because of the nature of the substance. One's designed to get harder, and the one's designed to melt. Well, the Word of God works that way when it comes to people. You see, I hold the key relative to what the Word of God does for me. Now, Pharaoh had every opportunity to understand that the will Moses, that the word Moses presented to him was God's will for the children of Israel. Every plague that was worked was a miracle, overthrowing every god any Egyptian ever trusted in then. But what did Pharaoh do? Well, that's why the Bible's so full of material. It says he hardened his own heart, and uh, God hardened his heart. And his heart was hardened. Well, I have to ask the question, how did God harden his heart? Well, in the sense that the word that came from Moses regarding God's will toward Israel, let my people go, the man was not disposed to do that. Who is this God that I should obey him? That was his attitude. Because he's no pagan. He thought of himself as a God. His definition, understanding what a God was, didn't take into consideration what the one true and living God was. So I'm a bigger God as you are, is basically what he was saying. And thus, even though to the honest, intellectual, rational mind, Moses proved that what he was saying was from God. And every miracle in those curses that took place, those plagues, overthrew a God of Egypt. And thus, who's greatest? but it didn't affect him. Toward the end, you know it did, but that wasn't long-lasting. And it took the death of his own firstborn son to do that. But that was just temporary. Because later he comes after them. But those miracles ultimately were designed to prove that God's speaking through Moses, and if you do what he says, you're pleasing God. But it didn't work for him. It wasn't the fault of God's Word. It accomplished just what it should do with a man of that kind of mentality. That kind of heart. That's why when you read in Luke 8, the description of the different kinds of ground, the singular seed of the kingdom was sown in, Luke 8, 11, that there's only one that brings forth fruit with patience, and that's the good and the honest heart. That's the inward man where your mind is, the real you. The others heard the same word, but according to the makeup, of the heart of each one of them, they rejected somewhere down the line the Word of God. That's why I think one of the things, and it's been on my lips for years, I can't tell you how long in my prayers, that I always have a good and honest heart. If I don't, I'm live back like Pharaoh. If I'm not honest with God and with myself, and especially with His Word that reveals to me what I must do to please Him to be saved from my sins. If I don't keep that honest good heart, you know what I'm more likely going to do? I'm going to start justifying myself for not rendering obedience to His will. I'm going to find a way to say, yeah, I know that's what it says. You know, Pharaoh could do that. I know what Moses said. There was no doubt that he knew what Moses said. He understood it. He knew it was directed at him as the monarch of Egypt. He had the power to let those people go. Why didn't he? Because it didn't make any difference to him about that coming from God and being proven to be from God and not from man by the miracles work in the plagues that were wrought upon him. He had plenty of time to do it, one plague after the other. 
day in and day out. And God really capped it off at the end of it. He got closer and closer to the very house of Pharaoh and finally said, all right, the others didn't work. Now it's going to hit you. Because who was that? The firstborn. What does that mean in a royal household? The next Pharaoh. And what does that mean about him being a god from their false perspective of a god? It means he'd be the next god. But that God's dead now, just over one night. And so is every other firstborn in all of Egypt. But what about the children of Israel? Their command was, you take this lamb and you kill it and you take the blood and you put it on the doorpost and the lintel. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. What did that do in the mind of all the Egyptians? We'll read how they reacted. They didn't just say, you're free to go. They said, let us help you go. Take this money. We'll finance the trip. <laughs> and that's how it works. The Word of God will save a person who will let it. And that depends on your attitude about it. But to the person whose attitude is not honest and not good, it'll harden it. That's why the Word of God won't return void. Even when it hits people who are dishonest and hits people who are honest. It will accomplish what it was meant to do. See, the Word of God not only was meant to include people into the body of Christ, but it was meant to exclude certain people. That's why you dare not compromise or tamper with the truth, because you change it, it'll start having people in the church. God never wanted that. To keep it pure, it'll reach out to the people that are convertible that are open, that have good and honest hearts, that will receive with meekness the engrafted word, that will obey the truth of God. But when you start changing it, it's going to condone things God doesn't condone, or it may prohibit things God doesn't prohibit. And it's going to start appealing to people who may not be the dispositional heart they ought to be. So we must have a good and honest heart. I suggest if it's not in your prayers now as a child of God, that you better start praying to always have a good and honest heart. If you don't, you won't be honest. And when you're not honest, well, you know, anything goes then. You could even become a politician. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Now, folks, listen to me. That's the only thing that's going to work, repentance. If you can't be brought to sorrow toward God for your personal sins against Him, you cannot repent. It's an impossibility. It's sort of like saying... Here's the light switch. Well, you've got to get the current of electricity through to the light. Well, the switch don't work. You can't get the current through to the light. Not normally speaking in the normal ways things work. Well, if you are not sorry toward God when you know you violated His will, can you be saved? When the Lord says, Now commandeth through Paul, all men everywhere to repent? Acts 17.30? No. So when we talk about repentance, oh, that's so important. People don't really even understand what that is. But what affects repentance we ought to be concerned about because you can't repent if you don't have the trigger mechanism to get you to repent. And if you don't have a good and honest heart, Luke 8.15, forget about this business of being sorry toward God for the transgressing of His will that we do, whether it's sins of omission or commission. For godly sorrow works repentance, notice, to salvation. Not to be repented of. In other words, that disposition never should be repented of, never should be turned from. It should be cultivated. So there ought to be something else in our prayers and in our work to always pray that we have a tender heart, easily pricked by the Word of God. A conscience that hurts so bad when we violate the truth of God's will. Because if that conscience will not accuse you, and that's what it does, accuse or excuse, to use the terminology of Paul in Romans, where he talks about it. If your conscience will not accuse you, that is, you're guilty because you broke the Word of God, then how are you ever going to be pricked in your heart? How are you ever going to have sorrow toward God? How are you ever going to break down the old stubborn will, the seed of all sin, rebellion against God? How are you ever going to repent? Which is turning away completely 
from whatever particular sin, but a life of sin in general. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. That, there's a host of folks who right now are possessed of the sorrow of this world. I think the best way to sum that up is, I robbed the bank and got caught. <laughs> and I'm very sorry for that because they're going to send me to the pen for 10 years or whatever. That's not sorrow toward God for your sins against Him. Recognizing then what it cost God to make possible your forgiveness of those sins and what all Christ did for us. What He had to sacrifice to make such possible. So we don't want the sorrow of this world. It'll not work repentance. But the sorrow for our sins against God within us will cause us to say, not my will, but thine be done. It will cause us to say, from now on out, everything I do is going to be by the authority of Christ. And when I see it's not, I'm going to turn from that way. And that's all we can do, you see. Once you have sinned, all you can do is call on God's mercy. All you can do is beg for His grace. And of course, to the alien sinner, that grace is offered in the great gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the land of beginning again. And in Christ, where we are favored, and it's in Christ that we're baptized, into Christ which we're baptized, they're added to the church, and then we're in a state of favor. Not enjoyed, as we said this morning, one must be doing those things that the Lord says Christians are to do. But that doesn't mean we're flawless even when we're as faithful as we could be. So we still need the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all sins. And then when we do commit sins that are of ignorance or weakness of the flesh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's only said to the one who's in Christ and being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That's the person that has a heart, a conscience, that is sorry toward God for his or her sins against God. That person will be moved by that sorrow to repent. Now, someone raised a question one time, said, well, how long? Do you have to have sorrow toward God before it brings about this repentance? And the easy answer to that is, as long as it takes. <laughs> just as long as it takes. And some people just have to get all the way down into the hog pen desiring to eat the food of the hogs. Other people got a little more sense in that, and they don't go that far, but... My prayer for anybody, if they're being stubborn against the truth, is that the Lord allow them to go as low as low can be low if it will cause them to turn from their sins and come to the Lord. I don't know what that may mean, but have you ever prayed in your own life that whatever it takes in your life to be faithful to God, that heaven will be your eternal home, God Almighty, let it happen. Because there's nothing we lose in this life that we could give in exchange for our soul. That's the attitude that you can see when you begin to read the Bible as to people who have godly sorrow. You remember Saul of Tarsus, three accounts are found in the book of Acts. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. And to see the full thing, you read all of them. But going back to Acts chapter 9... Notice what is said. The Lord has appeared to Saul of Tarsus. He's on his way to Damascus with authority to bind those who are Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. The Lord's appeared to him. And now watch what we have. After he heard the voice, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Now watch this. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now all those three days, he was a lost person. 
If they evidence anything, they evidence repentance. That is, not repentance, but sorrow toward God that works repentance. The man evidently is fasting, isn't he? He is so overwrought and broke down, he thought he was doing God's will and he was zealous about it. But he wasn't, and then it a jolt out of the blue, literally. Everything I thought that was right was as wrong as wrong ever could be. And now he, he is completely crumbled, but there is that sorrow in him for sins against the God he only sought to serve, but he was wrong. Brethren, the thing that is so hard for people to do is to look themselves in a mirror and say, Bud, you're the reason you're in the mess you're in. If you want to look for the person to blame, there he is looking right back at you. I am wrong. You find out how many people do that. It just doesn't happen. But he did. Now, why did God allow him three days blind and fasting before the gospel preacher that the Lord himself picked got to him with the rest of the gospel message? Why? You ever wonder about that? What's going on in Paul's mind? He can't see a thing. His whole world's been crushed, turned upside down, wrong side out. Everything he thought was right wasn't. Everything he'd been doing, the very trip he was on, was against God. Saul. Saul. Why? Persecutest thou me? And notice the honesty. Who art thou, Lord? Well, you big dummy, don't you know? No, that's how honest he was. He really thought he was finding a false messiah. He thought he was doing what the law required of him against somebody like that. But the Lord said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, it's hard to oppose the truth. Now, I don't, I don't guess I could ever know with my feeble mind the collapse of this man's being on the inside. Because if there's anything we know about Paul, he did what he thought was right, and he did it with all that he was, as zealously as he's a possible man to act. And now the whole life, is blown apart. It's just not there. Don't you know that in his mind as he prayed and fasted so intense that he ate nothing for three days, don't you know that echoed in his mind? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Don't you know all the people that he bound, and as he said later, he caused to speak against the Christ, he caused to blaspheme. And don't you know how it must have come back to him that I gave my vote against Stephen and held the clothes of those that stoned him to death? Don't you know that just rolled him over and over in his mind? Don't you know he begged and pleaded for mercy? And yet the gospel preacher hasn't told him the whole story on the complete plan of salvation. He's still a lost man. He's taken steps toward being saved, but he's not yet. It now comes to Ananias that the Lord chose to go to him, who gets there and finds out the man's state. Now, why tarryest thou? Right? Be baptized, wash away thy sins. End all of this confusion. Be saved from your sins. Be on God's side. And Paul would later say, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, he went into the street called straight there in Damascus and did as we read here. And he was ready then for the preacher to tell him what the Lord said. And he was baptized. And you know the rest of the story. What was in that man's mind? Well, let's see if we can't get a little bit of an idea of it by going back to the Old Testament. That sorrow so intense and so deep in his mind when he comes to the conclusion, I've been against God. I'm lost. Well, listen to David. And hear godly sorrow put into words. Have mercy upon me, O oh God, 
according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, think of Paul in this, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God, and listen, are broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, and shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Of course, he said this is David under the law of Moses and the way things were done. But do you see the disposition of heart? How can there anybody that's ever from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine not have experienced this same contriteness of heart, this same broken spirit, and cried out to the God of their salvation, Have mercy on me, O God. I say unto you, if that doesn't rule out the idea of somebody responding to the gospel invitation and sort of nonchalantly smiling and say, well, if I've sinned, will you forgive me? God have mercy, the torment for such souls as that who don't know godly sorrow from whatever. It's here. It's revealed. You hear it. You understand it. Thus let us follow it. And let us be filled with sorrow toward God for our sins against Him just as long as it takes till we can say words of like preciousness and importance as David wrote by inspiration in Psalm 51 when it comes to our sin or sins against God. Then we'll know what it is to stop sinning and turn from them and walk the straight and narrow way. That's how it works. It works no other way. A broken and contrite spirit. If there's arrogance and pride, then you can't have what he says here. So God of the long ago, through the sweet psalmist of Israel, has laid out before us a perfect picture of godly sorrow, which works repentance. There's only two things that can affect it. One of them is considering what's going to happen to me if I die in sin, the eternal damnation of the devil's hell. That's why it's in the Bible to say, here's what's going to happen to you if you don't learn to come to God and come to Him on His terms, as humble a heart as possible for you to have. The other, it's beautiful. 
That's found and set out in Romans chapter 2. Paul says to the church in Rome in chapter 2 and beginning verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Now listen. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Brethren, pause for a moment. We often think of what the Bible says as to the torments of eternal damnation because people chose to do it their way on earth rather than to use time and material things to find God and His will and learn that the conclusion of the whole matter of life is to fear God and keep His commandments. And thus, so many things are given as to the condemnation of men who die guilty of sin. But often we don't think about how that the goodness and forbearance and long-suffering of God leads us to repentance, which means it can lead us to sorrow toward God for our sins against Him. Which sorrow works that repentance? As I said, that's the trigger mechanism to repentance. Brethren, contemplate just for a moment. God loves us, and that even when we spurned Him, left Him, turned our back on Him, spoke against Him, denied His existence, and when He sent His only Son out of love for us, we killed Him. God still loves us. And He tells us over and over again, here is salvation. You know, the hardest thing to do is get people to go to heaven. Isn't that amazing? Offer eternal life to people. And they turn it down. But that's the goodness He has for all people. He's willing to forgive anybody, no matter how heinous the sin, if you will humble yourself and comply with His will. Ready to be forgiven. People won't do it. But His goodness is still there. And we said this morning about Peter's own statement concerning why time goes on. He's not willing that any should perish. But He wants everybody to repent. Which means he wants everybody to come to that sorrow toward him for their sins against him. Which sorrow works that repentance. So the goodness of God is seen in the Christ on Calvary's tree in the long ago suffering for us all. Nailed there. Willing to be there. Just to stay there six hours. I don't understand it. He willed himself to be there. Because he had to be there long enough to pay for my sins. Think about that. Going back through the garden. Why, let's go back to him leaving heaven. Why, just to leave the glories of heaven and become a man. That was in itself. Without any kind of persecution to leave all of that. But he did. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. My, He's going to become a part of His own creation. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now you can go on through there and read about John preceding Him, but you come to verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Listen. Full of grace and truth. So He came. He lived. He was tempted just like we are. But He never sinned. That's amazing. I'm flabbergasted when I think of that. Then He goes through all the misery of Gethsemane. All night long treated terribly by people who for 1,500 years have been taught the truth. And they hadn't believed it. Or if they had, they would have received it. And then he goes to Calvary's cross, so weak and beat down that he can't even carry the cross. And another has to carry it for him. And yet he has the presence of mind to when he sees the daughter of Jerusalem weeping, he says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Because he knew what was going to happen to the whole sinful crowd if they didn't repent. He allows himself to be nailed to that cross, reviled, spat upon, beaten before he ever got there. It's the reason he's so down and beat. But he allows it. And they couldn't have done it if he didn't want it. That's the goodness of God. It should move us to repentance. Through the godly sorrow it brings about. 
So he goes to the cross. He suffers on the cross. Suffering, I just can't fast. And then when it's all done, him knowing what ought to be, he wills himself to die. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Brethren, let me tell you something. And if you're here not a Christian, let me tell you something even further. If the contemplation of the eternal consequences of dying in sin unforgiven, sending you to a devil's hell will not move you to have sorrow toward God that will affect repentance, or, or and or, the goodness of God will not reach you, you are not reachable. Listen to me, brethren, and I beg it from the depths of my heart. We, many times, try to get people to the Lord in other ways other than the very precise and specific ways that brings about godly sorrow, which must be there in order for a person to be brought to repentance. There's only two things in the preaching of the gospel that can do that. And that's the goodness of God. And the thoughts, serious thoughts, of what's going to happen to you when you die, lost. If that will not move you to repentance, you can't be moved to repentance. You're lost. And you will forever remain lost till the Word of God can reach you in the way I just set forth in simplicity from the truth of the living God. When we go out to reach souls, whether they've fallen away or been overcome in a trespass or they're not Christians, we're trying to convert them. It's the gospel, not my maneuvering, that does it. It's the truth that moves people to sorrow toward God for their sins, that sorrow growing till it breaks down their old stubborn will. And no use tickling people under the chin and twisting their arms and coaxy, 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 all that kind of junk. You're either lost and going to hell right now, or you're not. And that's the same thing true of me. And it's true of the whole wide world. And there's only one gospel to save anybody. And that gospel, through the consequences of dying in sin and going to hell and presenting the great goodness of God, is the only thing to affect sorrow toward God for your sins against Him that exists. And if that's not there, you do not possess the wherewithal to break down your old stubborn will, the seed of all sin and rebellion against God, which is repentance, and thus embrace the truth. Now, when you have somebody in sin, as a member of the church now I speak, that's what they need to be helped, hit with. That's what they need to understand. Why well, you see people just proud, you know, well, I'll confess to this, but... You know where the fellow's going if he died right there? I have no doubt about it because I know what my book says and I believe it. That person is lost as anybody could ever be lost. And he'd be just like the rich man who when he died, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Folks, those words aren't in the Bible just to give us a little story. They're telling you what actually happens when you die unrepentant. The moment you step into eternity, you step into the fires of damnation. And he tells us, the road map's there, plain language. Oh, but let's see if we can work on it. We've got a little more sense than God does, and we'll tamper around a little more with it. You don't find that in the Bible. It's just not there. So let us as the church, as we go out to seek and save the lost, as God commands the church to do it, to, see, to do it on His terms. And just look many times at the master teacher, how he dealt with people to see whether they had any interest in the first place before he ever started trying to teach them. A lot of times we spin our wheels because we're trying to work with people that really don't care anyway. But they're too nice, quote, quote, to tell us I'm not interested in what you're doing. When's the last time somebody told you, I don't want to study the Bible, it doesn't interest me, I like you, but no, don't approach me with the Bible anymore. People are apt to do that. There's some, 
but they're not apt to do it. Not usually. So, what will we despise? Shall we despise the riches of His goodness and forbearance and the truth of God's will that to shows us what's going to happen when we die? I hope not. I hope we will have such a tender heart that these truths concerning salvation and damnation will move us to be sorry toward Him for our sins against Him, which sorrow will work repentance and nothing else can which repentance will cause us to die to whatever sin it is and rise up as one man to go forward down the pathway of righteousness that has always been straight and narrow, bound on all sides by the truth of the gospel, that we can reach the heavenly home someday. And that's the only path that goes there. Are you subject to the gospel invitation? We've studied what to do to become a Christian. As a child of God, are you faithful? Do you have a tender heart? Have you cultivated it since you obeyed the gospel? Have you grown in the knowledge of the truth? Well, whatever your state, God knows and you know. So we ask you to respond to the truth in this invitation while we stand and sing.